We're going to talk today about trauma and the results of trauma. And one of the things that probably many of you are thinking about is, oh, we're going to be talking about emotional trauma and uh, PTSD and things like that, which we will. But I really wanted to extend this because one of the things that oftentimes gets forgotten when people start working with brain training, which is what I like to call neurofeedback, um, is that there are lots and lots of kinds of trauma, including lots of physical trauma that happen in people's brains and that have a major effect in their lives, including uh, having an effect on, on their emotional uh, well-being. So we're going to start off with just a real quick, if some of you have already done some of the other workshops uh, and, and you have an option to, at the end, I'll show you how you can go back and look at the various different webinars that we have done. So you can try those out if you if you like this one. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the brain trainer approach. Uh, as Tamara mentioned, it's definitely grounded in science, and it may be a little more grounded in science than some of the more quote-unquote scientific systems that you're going to hear about uh, if you look around the field, like Z-score training and uh, population-based QEEGs and things like that. The first thing that is critical about the brain training, uh, the brain trainer approach is that we understand that brains are complex, adaptive, chaotic systems. They're not linear systems like cars or production lines or things like that. And so things like normative databases, which assume that we have a normally distributed uh, set of data about the brain, really don't apply because the brain is not a normal distribution. Uh, it's much more like an ecology or an economy in that it is a, a chaotic system which is made up of a number of other systems. And we'll talk about some of those things today. But as a result, we take a pretty different approach to, to looking at the brain, which begins with the idea that in most cases, many of the things that you might be interested in training, either for yourself, for your family, for some friends, or ideally for, for uh, clients, if you're a professional, we don't consider those things to be disorders. We talk about them as habits of the brain, because we understand that the brain is a machine that creates its own habits over a period of time, and that the older we get, the more stable those habits become and the more they control what we do in our lives, but usually oriented toward pretty young in our lives. That's where we start to form those habits. And so although the brain would not be what we would call abnormal, um, I would say generally there's no such thing as a not normal brain, if you understand complex adaptive systems, but it certainly might not be the most effective brain for the life that you want to live today. And so uh, basically the bottom line on this page, you don't have to be sick to want to improve. Uh, that's a key element in our system. So the brain is a finely balanced adaptive system. It learns how to deal with whatever comes at it from the universe, starting before it's born. If you're interested in finding out more about that, go back and, and listen to our last workshop, uh, which is about children and adolescents, because we started from the embryo and went on up from there. But there are two things that we're gonna talk about today. One of them is the physical brain and the physical brain largely is pretty much the same for everybody. It has hemispheres, it has lobes in those hemispheres, it has subcortical and cortical areas, um, it uses the same pattern of neurons throughout it and so forth. 
So that ordinarily is sort of a mainstay. Now, those th that physical brain can be different, will be different from person to person, but they're usually more alike than they are different. However, it's perfectly possible to have things traumatically affect that brain, the physical brain, which will also traumatically affect the energy brain. The energy brain uh, basically starts off with, this like any complex adaptive system, it starts off with what we call its, its uh, initial conditions. And one of those initial conditions is the physical brain. So if, if a child's physical brain uh, has been damaged somehow in the womb or has some kind of issue uh, that, that differentiates it from what we usually expect to see, then those initial conditions are going to be the kind of the foundation of the house that that person is going to develop. But then the complex adaptive brain begins looking at each new experience that it has, primarily uh, beginning with the the traumatic experience of being born, which to the the infant is like dying. I've been here in paradise for all this time, and now all of a sudden I'm out. What's going on? I have no idea what's going to happen when I get out through this this long dark tunnel with a light at the end. Um, and then it begins to experience life in the new world, and it begins to adapt by figuring out what seems to work in this situation, in this situation, in this situation. And the left hemisphere of the brain sort of becomes a rule book. It learns from the right side, here's something that works in this particular situation, and it keeps track of that. And increasingly, as we get older, it it increasingly applies those rules without necessarily looking at what differentiates this situation from previous situations. Okay, so it develops based on its feedback experiences. And in fact, that's the only thing that actually changes a complex adaptive system, and that is feedback. Uh, if you listen to some of the other webinars that we've done in this series, you'll, you'll get a better idea of how that works and why that's important. It, as I said, establishes habitual responses over time, and those are based pretty much on past experience, not necessarily on what's the best thing for us right now. Um, so in many cases, by the time we get into our 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, we begin to recognize that the habits that our brains have, which you might call anxiety, or you might call being depressed, or you might call being impulsive, or you might call a peak performing or whatever, those aren't necessarily the things that we would like to have as the major arms in our, in the major arrows in our quiver. And we can use brain training to go back and adjust the way our brain looks at the world in response to it. So let's talk about trauma, since that's the title of our, of our project today. Definition of trauma is that it's a situation where the brain needs to have greater control than it has. If you're watching a football game with your best friend and you really couldn't care less which team wins, but you're just watching because you enjoy watching the game and your best friend is watching his team play against his arch rival team, then it's very likely that the, your, your friend is going to be much more stressed by that game than you are. You can just watch it. That person has a desired outcome. He wants one team to win and he can't really control that. So, that becomes a, a stressful event. And stressful events trigger what's called the autonomic nervous system. We probably, if you've heard the sympathetic nervous system called the fight or flight system. And when we get stressed, we trigger the fight or flight system, whatever we can do. 
if we're in a situation where we can't control the outcome, whether it's the outcome of a football game or what my kid decides to do about college or how my wife responds to something uh, in our relationship, then that triggers that response. And if because of the situation, we can't control it, then the fight or flight response basically is of no value. I can't fight it and I can't run away from it. So that becomes trauma. Trauma is when I want something to happen very badly. I've got all my resources ready, but I can't change it. So the, the third option often talked about besides fight or flight is freeze. I just have to accept what's there, but I really don't want to. So we've talked about trauma, but there is physical trauma, as I mentioned before, and physical trauma is different because physical trauma doesn't just cause me to have an emotional experience. Physical trauma literally changes the resources that my brain has available to it. So it's, it's not just changing my habits, it's changing what I've got to work with. And energy trauma changes those brain patterns. Uh, and so that's, that's something different. We're gonna talk about both of those today. The big issue with trauma is that it disturbs the balance in the brain and our brains are finely balanced systems that work very efficiently to, especially early in life, to try and get us into a situation where we're going to have the best chance of getting the responses that we want to get in our lives. So what trauma tends to do, whether it's physical or emotional or energy related, is that it tends to push the subsystems of the brain beyond the, the limits that they would ordinarily operate in and sometimes pushes them into a new role. A good example of this is a person who's had a stroke uh, on, in the left front. On the left front side of your brain is an area called Broca's area, and Broca's area is an area which is related to producing speech. And if you have a stroke in that area, you won't be able to speak. But there is, on the right side, almost exactly the same location, there's another area, F7 is on the left, F8 is on the right. And F8 is kind of like an understudy actor who knows the part of the main player, but doesn't get to play it. He just sort of stands around backstage and mouths the words while the primary actor is out on stage doing it. But F8 also has some other functions that it has to perform. In the case of a stroke, then what often happens is that the person, as you start to recover from the stroke will begin to be able to speak again, although not quite as fluently or as well as they did before, because F8 will take over that function now that F7 has just basically a bunch of dead neurons. So um, in that case, F8 is doing something that it wasn't originally designed to do. It was designed to be a backup. Now it's the, the main player. And that forces other systems in the brain to do additional things too, because now some of the things that F8 used to do, it can't do because it's doing what F7 used to do. And so other parts either have to pick up the slack or we become less effective at doing those other things. Okay, so there are three main sources of trauma that we're gonna talk about today. Two of them are probably things that you don't really think of very often when you think about trauma because emotional trauma has become such a hot button topic in our culture. The first of those are what we're gonna call exogenous physical damage. Those are things that are caused from the outside and they literally physically damage the brain. Then there are endogenous from the inside, disease processes, uh, 
which can also damage the physical brain. And then finally, there are what we could call excessive or extended emotional drive issues, uh, issues that we just aren't prepared to be able to handle uh, the emotional part of something that cause our brain to establish patterns that uh, are wasteful of energy, uh, may block us from doing things that we'd like to do and so forth. And we'll talk about those in some detail. Those are certainly related to the more traumatic uh, emotional issues that you're likely thinking about. So let's talk about exogenous physical damage first. As we mentioned before, physical trauma actually reduces the resources or changes their capability. And so it's like having a car that all of a sudden the brakes don't work. Well, that's going to cause problems in a lot of different areas. So physical trauma that affects the resource system that we're working with not only has that effect, but it also disrupts a whole bunch of other things that we would ordinarily do. Now I can't step on the brakes and slow down. I have to downshift to try and slow down. I have to drive more slowly so that I can slow down more easily, stay further back from other cars and so forth. And so um, they can be very, very disruptive. One of the most... Um, commonly seen issues here are what are called closed head injuries. And one of the things that's in interesting about closed head injuries is how many people have them and how few people recognize that they have them or even remember that something happened. One of the types of closed head injuries, most closed head injuries are things that happen without breaking the skull, breaking the, the skin and so forth. Uh, but then there are what we could call um, more traumatic types of issues like Phineas Gage, who had a railroad spike driven at high speed up through his prefrontal cortex uh, that went in and came out the top of his brain. He, he lost vision in one of his eyes, but he was able to function just that all of his friends who knew him said, he's gone. The person that we used to know is not there anymore. Now there is a guy who is a completely different personality. So that, that impact, which could have happened as a closed head injury, just by getting whacked in that, that area of his head, or could have happened with this more traumatic uh, broken head injury that had the same effect it caused an area of the brain not to be able to work. The second issue that we're going to talk about are what we call iatrogenic. Those are things that are caused by physicians, caused by treatment issues. When you take medication, when you have surgery, especially in your brain, but in other areas as well, if you have someone who thinks that uh, giving you shock treatments in your brain is still a good idea, or many other kinds of, of medical treatments, those can all have phys physiological effects that make your brain not work as well physically, and that's going to have an effect on your, your emotional and, and cognitive way to, that you're able to process. And then finally, there are some things that, that we can see which are more environmental things that uh, come from outside the brain. So let's talk about a head injury. Head injuries are one of the most common things that most of us have and something that most people don't even know about. In fact, one of the most often used databases for you know, what's called a normative database when people are comparing your brain against a bunch of other people that were recorded 20 or 30 years ago. That's called um, the normative database. But when I started back in the early 90s, that database was still there, but then it was called the Thatcher Head Injury Database. And it was used to identify people who had head injuries. Mm -hmm. 
because there were certain specific things that you would usually see in their head. And Bob Thatcher, the guy who developed that database, uh, in, in a number of groups that I was on, said in many different situations that he thought anywhere from 50 to 80 or 90 percent of the people in the United States or in the world, I don't recall exactly, had significant head injuries. Could happen when you're a kid, you fell down, banged your head on the fireplace, you got hit with a baseball bat, you uh, fell down some stairs or later on got thrown through a windshield or many different things that happen. And they often happen fairly early in our lives when we tend to be less careful and maybe a little bit less protected and our skull is not as thick. And very frequently what happens is we literally don't remember that it ever happened. And in many cases, when I see an image in an assessment that says to me, boy, this person really looks like they had a closed head injury, then, and that will show up if it happened 30 years ago or if it happened two years ago, uh, the client will have to ask a parent, do you ever remember that I fell down or got hit or anything in this area of my head? And the parents will think about it for a while. Usually the mom come back and say, yeah, as a matter of fact, there was a time when this happened to you, but you know, we took you to the doctor and the doctor said, nah, everything's okay. Well, it is okay, you're still alive, your brain still works, but it's working with one hand tied behind its back from that point forward. And your energy brain is responding to that fact as well. So there are two major types of uh, head injury trauma, closed head injury trauma. There's what's called gray matter damage. Your, your neurons are made up of uh, brain cells, and the brain cells appear to be gray. That's why we say that the, the, the brain is, is made up of gray matter. Those are the things which produce the energy and send the pulses of energy that carry signals throughout our brain. And when you kill neurons, as you would with, say, a stroke, where all of a sudden the blood supply is, is not there, or a, a straight-on blow to your head, um, those neurons are killed, but they are replaced. The brain we now know, back in the 90s when I started, I was taught that, no, you have all the neurons you're going to have when you're born, and they die as you get older, and there's no way to replace them. But that has since been proven to be completely wrong, and we recognize that neurons and brain cells are, are changed, are added throughout our lives. So the neurons are replaced, but the fact that a new neuron steps in and takes the place of one that was killed doesn't necessarily mean that that neuron functions in all of the areas and all of the ways that the old neuron did. In fact, oftentimes we can see when we look at the map on an assessment that there is a place where there is a frequency called alpha. Alpha is the frequency of sort of being there, not processing, but just being there, being aware. And so if we see alpha with eyes closed, and then when we open our eyes, the alpha stays there. And more importantly, when we're doing a task, a processing task, the alpha still stays there and we see what we call a spike of alpha. That is a fairly high amount of alpha, even when there shouldn't be alpha at task, that indicates that there's a, a bunch of neurons there that are, they're newcomers, they're sitting in the place of old neurons that were killed, but they aren't really doing a very good job of participating in the networks. And so that will have an effect on how well your brain is able to operate. Uh, there's also a kind of damage called white matter damage, and that would be more where you have something that causes, sort of bounces off your head and makes it go to one side or the other, or the classic is a whiplash. In those cases, what happens is you don't kill the neurons, 
but you basically rip them free from the the connective tissue, the the axons, which carry the signals from one neuron to the next one and make up the network. So the neurons remain in place and they are replaced from time to time and so forth, but there isn't any way that we know of so far to actually get white matter to reproduce itself and reconnect neurons. If you remember Christopher Reeve, the guy that played Superman and had the spinal cord injury, that was the issue for him, that he was unable to replace the white matter in the spinal cord. So um, those connections are not replaced. The neurons are still there, but they are working basically at the lowest common denominator of the brain, which is delta, meaning I'm sort of unconscious in that area. I'm not really doing anything with that part of my brain because nothing is coming into it and it's not sending anything out. And so we'll see the same kind of thing. We'll see a spike with eyes closed, with eyes open and a task. We'll see that there's a high amount of delta in this particular area, delta being the slowest brain speed, usually the speed that you would see if you were in a coma or if you were in deep sleep. So um, those are two things that would allow us, looking at the brain on a map, to say, wow, looks like there was this kind of a head injury that occurred in this area. No way of telling when or how long ago or anything else, but we can get a pretty good idea of what area is being affected. And then penetrating wounds are going to be a variety of different things that they may simply be nothing going on there, sort of a dead spot uh, because there aren't any neurons there. Um, or they may show up as a as a delta or an alpha as well. Okay, so um, the thing that's kind of interesting is that physical damage, which seems like it would be a real problem, would be something that would really limit you, in many cases is one of the easier things to deal with. So that we have sometimes uh, results that occur in training that appear to be impossible. One of my favorite clients when, when I was in Atlanta was not somebody that I worked with, but one of my other trainers did. But his mom came in and said he had had surgery uh, because he was having seizures and the surgery removed three quarters of the cortex on the left side of his brain. That's the language side of the brain. That's the rules and the math side of the brain. And that area was just not there. And the left hemisphere of the cortex or the, the cortex is the area that actually produces EEG. So when she asked if I thought we could have any effect because he was having very, very difficult time with language, I said, I really don't know because I don't even know what we're gonna train. The thing that we would ordinarily train is not there. Uh, but we did an assessment and there was something there that was, that was producing EEG. And we went ahead and trained him for I think 15 or 20 sessions. And this essentially, if I had been, if I had been a good boy and told the person what I really knew, uh, I would have said, no, I'm sorry, forget it. There's not going to have any effect because there's no way to do this. But I learned pretty early on not to ever say that brain training couldn't work because I'd seen it work with so many things that literally, theoretically, it couldn't work with. And this guy, within 10 sessions, was talking up a storm. He was reading, getting information from his reading. His math skills had improved. And... To this day, I have no idea what we trained and I have no idea how his brain made that change, but it did, even without the thing that we should have been training there. Margaret Ayers, uh, who's no longer with us, but it was one of the early pioneers of neurofeedback. Margaret used to take people who were in comas where they're unconscious. So essentially, 
the brain can't be getting feedback because the brain isn't awake to get feedback. And she would bring people out of comas, not everybody, but an awful lot of them, just doing neurofeedback. Um, and there was also in the, in the back of the head where we handle things like uh, gait, the way, the way you walk, uh, and balance, those are handled by structures in the back of the brain, uh, the cerebellum and some other areas back there, which don't make EEG. They don't have the right kind of neurons to make EEG. So there's no sense in trying to train them because there's nothing to train. There's not EEG back there. But there have been a number of, of stories uh, that may or may not be true, but enough of them that I'm, I'm inclined to believe them, of people who train back there where there isn't any EEG and produce significant changes in the amount of uh, the, the person's ability to walk better, more smoothly and so forth, and to improve their, their balance. So one of the things that is kind of cool about doing neurofeedback, and one of the things that I have to keep reminding myself is, and because as I get older, obviously I become more hidebound and more sure that I know everything there is to know, just like all old people, um, that really with the brain, we think we know a lot more than we really do. There are people who talk about a quantum brain, um, which I'm not even sure what that means, except that, for example, in quantum mechanics and quantum physics, we know that it's possible for the same particle to be in two places at the same time, which in Newtonian physics, we'd say, Wait, no, I'm sorry, that, that it doesn't work that way. But in quantum mechanics, it does. And the quantum brain is considered to be possibly something that is beyond the physical brain that we are looking at. We think we know a great deal about the physical brain, but that may simply be an underlying part of a thing that we can't really see very well at this point. Um, and that may also help to explain one of the big issues for many people when they start doing brain training. And that is you say, oh, this person has too much of this frequency in this location, and that's why they're anxious. And so we train to reduce that frequency and that location. And the person gets much less anxious, just doesn't have an anxiety problem anymore. But if we go back and look at the EG again, we see that they still have too much of whatever it was that we were training in the place that we were training it. So although the thing that we thought we were training to make the change had the effect that we wanted, it didn't show in the EEG. <clears throat> so again, bottom line rule is as a general rule, don't ever say never when you're doing neurofeedback, when you're doing brain training. When people come to me, I mean, yeah, if somebody says, I've got a broken leg, can neurofeedback help with that? Then I would say, uh, I'm sorry, that's, that's not going to work because that's a physical issue related to a bone. But if it comes from the brain, the chances are that by training it, you can have a positive effect on it. Whether you understand how you did it or not, it can still be positive. Okay, so <clears throat> let's talk about a second kind of physical trauma, which are the iatrogenic physician-caused effects. Brain surgery, which is, of course, one of the things that physicians like to do because only they can do surgery, is um, there have been some rather odd approaches to working with people using surgery over the years, everything from removing the prefrontal cortex uh, so that the person would be, you know, would not have the control center in place. A low, uh, it's not called a lobectomy anymore, but, but at any rate, uh, that, that 
kind of surgery has been done for many years. I don't think it's done very often anymore. Back in the 50s, there was uh, a solution to the problem of people who had refractory seizures, who had seizures that didn't get better, no matter what drugs you gave them, where the doctor simply decided, well, you know what we'll do, we'll just cut the brain in half lengthwise, which we'll is split the corpus callosum, which allows the two sides of the brain to talk to each other <clears throat> and share information. And that will stop the seizures from crossing over from one side to the other. Well, it did have, it did have that effect. Uh, people still had seizures, but the seizures stayed on one side of the brain. So maybe they weren't quite so dangerous, but literally there were all kinds of bizarre side effects uh, from the split brain surgery, including a person being able to pick up an orange with his right hand, which connected to the left side of the brain, and know the name of the thing, but not really be able to tell you what it was or how it worked or how you ate it or anything else like that, or vice versa. They could, they could feel the orange, they knew what to do with it, but they couldn't think of the name for it. Um, there are places like this the result that was uh, for the young, young man who had three quarters of his left, left side cortex removed. That is a way to stop having seizures on the left side if you don't mind the fact that you're probably not going to be able to talk or do math or have many other functions that, that work. So uh, there are certainly brain surgeries removing tumors. Uh, and repairing things, you know, that are that are broken in the brain, which are probably the best solutions that we have. But at the time that we were doing the, or we still were doing the uh, split brain surgery, Barry Sturman had already demonstrated that just by training the sensory motor cortex to increase the amount of the frequency called SMR and reduce the frequency called theta, he could take people who were actually candidates for split brain surgery because they had seizures that nothing was touching and in many cases actually fix that so that people no longer had seizures and either were not taking or were taking very little medication to stop them from having the seizures. So doing surgery is not necessarily because it's the only option, but it's the one that physicians tend to like. But there are, as in many of the things that physicians do, there are side effects. And the side effects are a much bigger problem for for the client than they are for the for the person who's doing the surgery or giving the medication, but they are a problem. We know that medication is commonly used with any kind of brain activity uh, or so-called mental health disorders and many kinds of physical issues as well, and that those things have slightly more than uh, a better effect than just taking a sugar pill, except that they also have all kinds of side effects. If you watch the commercials on TV, I guess I'm too old. I watch the, the stations that I watch. All I hear about is, you know, what great Medicare options there are for me and drugs for everything. And those drugs, you watch the ad and they sort of hint that it might be helpful for you with this, but that don't pay attention to this, but here's something that could happen. Here's something that could happen. Here's something that could happen. All these bad, horrible effects could occur when you take these medications. And we know, especially with psychoactive medications that try to change neurotransmitter activity, that they become very, very difficult to stop taking. So when you start taking some of those medications to get off of them 
is extremely difficult because what actually happens is the brain adjusts itself to the fact that there is this chemical in there that's not from the brain. And so it changes the way the synapses work. Um, and that causes a lot of problems, or it can. It's one of the first things when we do neurofeedback with somebody when we start doing brain training is that if the person's on medications and frequently by the time someone gets to us to work with the brain, they're already taking two or three or four or even five different medications uh, to help them sit quietly in school or do whatever it is that they want to do. So um, that's one of our first tasks is to actually get those chemicals out of the brain without having the client commit suicide or, or become uh, terribly uncomfortable because training the brain to change itself with all of that chemistry in there is like trying to dig a hole in a swamp. You shovel out the mud and more mud flows in. There's just too much chemistry in the brain. Another issue is, I still hear about this being done from time to time, is uh, electroconvulsive therapy, where you literally shock the brain uh, and, and give the person a convulsion in order to quote unquote reset it so that it will work better. We know that it has a terrible effect on memory. We know that it's a very unpleasant experience. We know that it often has a very temporary effect on, say, depression, but it's used quite often. I, I wouldn't say that now anymore. I'd say that, but it's used, still being used. There are also uh, things like anesthesia for any kind of surgery or treatment for things like cancer, which have very strong effects on particular frequencies in the brain. It's not uncommon for there actually to be called an anesthesia effect. When you have general anesthesia, your brain is given this tremendous whack of stuff to slow it down. And that often is very difficult for it to come back out of. So the things that would be related to an extremely slow brain are something that you have to train for to get over it. And people who've had uh, chemotherapy or doing radiation therapy will oftentimes have additional issues like that, which you have to train to <clears throat> help the person get over them. So those are all effects that are accepted because they're actually produced as a part of treatment. Then there are some environmental effects. Uh, there are different things that can happen as a result of poisoning, water supplies and lead and things like that that can get into a person's brain. <coughs> People develop what are called multiple chemical sensitivities, which are uh, extreme sensitivities that occur in the brain so that a person will walk into a room that has carpet and they have all kinds of negative effects. Um, those are things where the brain is basically being attacked externally by some chemical in the environment. <clears throat> Fetal alcohol syndrome and things like that are also environmental effects that just turns out that they are the, the internal environment of the, uh, the mother at the time when the child is dependent on the mother for the environment in which he or she is living. So the energy response to physical losses is very important. Uh, I just, one of the uh, work, uh, clients that I just did an assessment on with one of the master trainers because it was a very interesting and unusual case. And I'm going to be doing uh, a webinar on this, which will be a, a case study. So you can actually, if you're interested, look at the assessment and see 
how we were able to figure out what was going on in that person's brain from the data and the trainer's cue assessment is that as specific physical areas are affected, the brain changes its own energy patterns to try and deal with that. So um, as I mentioned before, if we have a stroke which knocks out the left side, uh, the F7 prefrontal cortex, which is Broca's area, the language processing area or language output area, then it's not uncommon for the brain to try and move that to a different place. One of the issues for people as we get older is that our working memory often begins to suffer. We have a harder time remembering what we were starting to say after we get about three quarters of the way through the first session, the sentence. So it's harder for us to remember where we were going um, or we have difficulty remembering language or words or things like that. That partly is true relative to a change in the peak frequency of alpha, one particular frequency. But also there are two specific areas where if you look at a young person's brain, those areas are related to working memory. F7, which is in the left front, and excuse me, F3, which is in the left front, and P4, which is in the right sort of rear of the brain, those two areas are very much related to where we do working memory. And when we see people who are in their 60s and 70s, it's very common to see that the brain has shifted away from those areas and it's now using other areas which are not as well designed for, uh, for working memory for whatever reason, the brain simply doesn't, isn't using the same sites. So those areas take on new tasks, which means that they're less able to do the things that they're supposed to do. And they are also probably not as good for doing the things that we're asking them to do. The left side of the brain is physiologically quite different from the right side. It has it has more neurons, the neurons are closer together, they have shorter connections. So the left side is very, very good for fast activity. That's the kind of thing that we would use for language processing. The right hemisphere <clears throat> uh, tends to be fewer neurons, but further apart with longer connections. So they don't just connect with other neurons around them they connect with other areas of the brain. And we say that the left side of the brain is the text side of the brain and the right side is the context side. Working together, that's great because we can see the details of what we're looking at in the context of the big picture. But if we lose the text side and all we have is the context side, that's obviously not going to be as, as efficient. <clears throat> Um, and also because one of the areas is not working very well, our brain's ability to connect the left and right sides or connect from one area to another starts to fail or at least be reduced. And when that happens, the brain is not as efficient doing what it's supposed to do. And in fact, it may not do it very well at all. It will at least require a lot more energy to do the same thing. So when we have physical losses, we really would like to be able to help the brain work through those. And one of the ways we can do that is to train the areas immediately around an area where there's gray matter damage or white matter damage to actually get those areas to sort of pitch in and help out in the places where the neurons have been damaged. Okay, we also have endogenous disease processing. So seizures, strokes, birth trauma, all of those things happen inside the brain, <clears throat> not because of any necessarily external thing, but just some problem with the way the brain works. Down syndrome, comas, 
all of those things are are endogenous internal disease processes which have a major effect on how well the brain physically is able to work. And then we also have deteriorative processes like Alzheimer's, like Parkinson's, like uh, MS, uh, like dementia, where in Alzheimer's there's actually a physiological blocking of the synapses, of the links between neurons in a network so that we can train to increase the energy levels, but if there is a wall across the, neur uh, across the neuron connection, then it doesn't really matter how fast you're going. When you hit that wall, you're not going through it. And so we don't make connections. We don't remember things. We lose information and so forth. Parkinson's is actually related to the death of dopamine producing neurons in the back of the brain so that the amount of dopamine, which is a very important brain chemical, is reduced. And two of its major functions, one is uh, having positiveness of experience. People with uh, low dopamine levels oftentimes see the world in a much more negative way, but also uh, they are that's very related to physiological control. So we're more likely to see tremors and uh, ticks and things like that. Um, and nothing we do with neurofeedback is going to bring those dopamine producing neurons in the back of the head back to life. We can improve the flow of dopamine from what there is to get up to the front so that they can they can be more effective. But at this point, we don't have a way of reversing this or bringing somebody back from it for either one of these. MS is actually related to a deterioration of the, the white fatty sheath, the sort of like insulation that goes on the cable and a wire that actually allows the brain to send signals faster uh, and as that as that begins to deteriorate and, and go up, go away, what happens is that the brain can't send the messages as fast. The brain slows down, and most of the things that we use our brain faster speeds for, like language processing, like processing in general, just don't happen very well anymore. And we don't know of a way to make the myelin come back. Dementia, uh, oftentimes related to simply the same things that cause your heart to have problems. That is, the blood supply to that area is not very good in the brain. Uh, and the, um, the level of oxygen may not be very good. So those brain cells are not getting what they need metabolically to be able to fire faster. Again, that's related to language processing, that's related to working memory, and that's related to a number of other things. Um, and so with dementia, sometimes we can have a positive effect if we can work with it soon enough. The endogenous issues, because they are internal and because in many cases they are deteriorative, are the ones which tend to be the hardest ones to train. Seizures, often very, very successful. Uh, if we train what's called the, the Sturman protocol that I mentioned before, um, that is, is something that can be extremely successful working with most seizure disorders, especially if there's not a real strong physical reason for them and that there's been damage to the brain. Um, and oftentimes, uh, issues related to uh, closed head injuries can, can effectively be treated. Brain training can actually improve the ability of uh, areas that have lost the ability to produce faster speeds to increase the speeds that they're processing and to improve or increase new connections so that we're able to reactivate some of those areas. But there are others, especially the deteriorative processes, where we can 
basically ameliorate symptoms. We can make it a little bit easier for the person to live with a problem, but we don't necessarily have the ability to stop the deterioration. So, and there are other things which have Down syndrome and things like that, where the, the level of response that we're able to achieve is very, very slight. So it's, it's very difficult for us, for me at least, to say, yeah, come on in, we'll work with them, and I think we'll be able to get good results. Um, there are some other techniques that are being tested, particularly in the area of Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, which are metabolic changes, way of changing diet and, and some other things. Uh, there's a guy named uh, Dale Bredesen, who's a physician. He's been working in this area for quite some time and has achieved some pretty amazing results and some other people working with Parkinson's. He, Bredesen's been working with Alzheimer's, who literally not only have stopped the deterioration, but in some cases they've actually reversed it. So people who had Alzheimer's symptoms not only didn't get worse, but actually got better. So there are things like that that are coming along, and hopefully as we keep our eyes open, we'll be able to implement some of those things or coexist with someone who's using those things to help reverse uh, and, and make the brain training that we're doing more effective. So let's look at the last group, which is perhaps the one that many of you are most interested in. And that is uh, where we have excessive or extended drive effects. That is that the brain, for one reason or another, is having to produce a tremendous amount of energy because of the habits that it has formed. And that results in uh, hypervigilance or extreme sensitivity, or in many cases, both of them where there's a, uh, where there, the brain is producing a lot of very fast activity, using a tremendous amount of energy, does not have the ability to go into the pure awareness state, oftentimes does not have the ability to get in, in touch with its own subconscious, its own ability to understand its, its experiences, especially emotional experiences, and as a result of that, those things are blocked off. So a person who's been through an extremely traumatic experience, uh, being abused as a child or being neglected as a child or going through <laughs> a very negative and, and painful divorce over a period of time or being in a war zone or things like that, those are all situations that stress the brain's ability to deal with the world around it to the extent that it can't do things in an ordinary way, either doing them very well or not doing them very well. It just can't. And as a result, um, it becomes anxious and then it moves on into depression. Anxiety is the response when the brain gets overly activated, when it turns on the fight or flight system all the time or too often. And if you keep doing that over a period of time, especially if you don't have the ability in your brain to rest, to idle, when there isn't something that has to be done, because your brain never believes that there isn't something that has to be done, then you literally burn out your adrenal system and you end up with a depressive state where you you just essentially get tired. You have no resources because you burn them all out. So those things can happen anywhere from the womb, uh, a, a child who has a very, very anxious mother or a mother who's being traumatized, uh, being physically abused or neglected or has no support or whatever, since the child shares the blood chemistry of the mother, those things get built in to 
the blood chemistry and the way that the brain experiences life before it ever goes through the process of suddenly being kicked out of of paradise where it doesn't have to do anything. Everything is taken care of for it and goes down that tunnel and comes out into a whole new universe uh, in which it it has no no power, no understanding, no knowledge or anything else. And in many cases, if that if that child goes into that new universe, the only person that they know that they can trust is the birth mother. They know the birth mother's smell. They know the birth mother's chemistry. They know the birth mother. They know they recognize that body because they've been a part of it for so long. And when that body is not there or it's there briefly and then gone, then the brain sort of goes into a position of saying, what did I do to make her go away? And then we'll see what is called RAD, reactive attachment disorder, where the brain in many cases simply isn't able to form connections with other people because it can never trust that those other people, no matter how well they treat me, no matter how much they love me, give me nurturing and all those kinds of things, there's always that fear in the back of my mind, I'm going to do something that's going to make them go away because I don't know what I did that made the first one go away. So these guys could go away too. And so I can't let people get close to me. Uh, I just have to take care of myself, even though I'm totally powerless. So those are all things that can happen early in life um, that can cause problems because, because the brain gets so pushed into fast speeds. It becomes hypervigilant. It's always looking for danger. It's always looking for disappointment. And of course, if you're always looking for something, you will always find it. Uh, and then that's extreme sensitivity is also related to the very fast activity so that you're, you're overly conscious of and aware of everything that's happening around you. Um, so this is one of the things that I ask people when they get started doing brain training to not to do. And if you're on any one of our lists or the, like the brain trainer list or the newbie, uh, what's up list, you're going to see that no matter how many times I say, don't do this. It's something that people do regularly. Someone will come in and say, I have Joe Blow syndrome. And the person will go to the list and say, anybody ever worked with Joe Blow syndrome? Anybody had any success with it? Are there any protocols that we use for it and so forth? And if I'm, if I'm being well behaved, I don't answer it. But if I'm not, I say, don't ask that question. Joe Blow syndrome comes from the brain. It is related to the fact that the brain is doing this or it's not doing that. Um, and therefore, if it's coming from the brain and you train the things in the brain that are likely to be related to it, then you can change it. So instead, what I ask people to do is before you start training somebody's brain, find out what it's already doing. That makes sense. Don't just say, oh, I read on the internet that this works for X. Well, it works for anxiety, but there are 10 different patterns for anxiety. And, and so unless you know which patterns are existing in this brain, you may spend a lot of time training things that aren't problems in that brain and really aren't going to have any effect. So what we recommend is that you do the assessment the trainer's cue identifies the patterns that exist in that person's brain and identifies those things that the person wants to change. So we can say, oh, this person has too much fast wave activity on the right side, and therefore we want to train to reduce that 
at these sites where the person has that pattern. And the whole brain training plan works with all of the various different issues that appear in your brain that relate to the things that you want to train. And so by going through that and cycling through the plan, the tendency is that you will change whatever it is that the client wants to work on. And you'll also have all kinds of side effects, just like medications do, except that the side effects will generally be positive. That the person never mentioned that the child who's hard to wake up in the morning, who can't stay focused on homework assignments and never completes anything and can't stay focused outside of his head, so he has problems with social situations and so forth, gets better in those areas, but also stops wetting the bed or also stops, you know, being difficult to wake up in the morning because all of those things are related to the patterns in the brain. If you can work with those patterns in the brain, if you can identify what they are and work with them, then you can actually change that. 